Hello, everyone. Um, it feels a little strange to be talking into this void. Um, as Alyssa said, I'm used to doing this program each summer in person. So we've been able to have students actually come out to Herman Miller, tour the archives. Um, and while we can't do that this year, I'm really glad that we're able to do this virtually. And I can tell you guys a little bit about um, my background, how I got into the design industry, uh, what it means to be an archivist for a furniture company, um, and just some of the fun things that I get to do. So as Alyssa said, um, if you have questions that come up during this, please feel free to put them in the chat box um, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, but I'll start with what is Herman Miller? Um, and in case you don't know what Herman Miller is, it is a 115 year old furniture company that is based in um, Zealand, Michigan. Um, so you might know us as the company that uh, makes the chairs by Charles and Ray Eames or uh, case goods by George Nelson or crazy textiles and furniture by Alexander Girard or you might be maybe sitting in an Aeron chair uh, designed by Bill Stumpf and Don Chadwick. Um, all to say that I think um, sometimes people know Herman Miller either as sort of the mid-century modern furniture company or through their office space um, which is kind of where we mostly play now in the, the office furniture industry, but kind of getting back into uh, residential furniture um, through acquisitions like Design Within Reach, which is part of the Herman Miller family now. So from a retail perspective, um, and then with the recent uh, acquisition of the Danish design company, Hey, So kind of getting back to our roots as a residential furniture company. But this is a picture of one of the buildings from our headquarters here in Michigan. Um, this building was designed by George Nelson and it kind of gives you the sense of place. Um, Herman Miller, while it is a globally renowned design company, it's here in Michigan, which I'm gonna do the Michigan person thing and show you on my uh, mitten where it's at. Um, ooh, I'm trying to advance. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, again, some older photos of our headquarters, but just giving you it's, you know, kind of located in the middle of a cornfield. It's not necessarily in a bustling metropolis. Um, but I don't know that the company could have uh, grown and thrived anywhere else. Um, a little bit of my background. So, uh, as Alyssa said in that very nice introduction, my background is in libraries. Um, and I kind of imagine myself initially working in a rare book library. And these are um, screenshots from my Instagram that I started way back as an undergrad, um, where I found myself in the stacks of a rare book library reshelving um, really old books that were also constructed really amazing and had these beautiful marbled end papers that were sort of my favorite thing to peek inside of. And, I knew that I was lucky that um, I was seeing these things and not everybody could. So it was sort of my early uh, experimentation with sharing collections material on a digital platform. This was back in um, 2010, 11-ish, I think Instagram was around then, but all to say um, kind of the early, um, early times of sharing museum collection material on Instagram. Um, and after doing an undergrad in art history and then getting my master's in library science, I got a job as an archives assistant at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, um, digitizing the Miller House and Garden Collection, which is an architectural archive for the Miller House, which you're seeing here, probably its most famous view, but this is the conversation pit in the home. Um, the house was designed by Aero Saarinen with Alexander Girard, Charles and Ray Eames designed some custom furniture for the home. Um, but during the design, building and maintenance of the house, um, an archival collection was amassed of things like correspondence, design drawings, textiles for every single one of those pillows that you see there in the conversation pit. And my first job was a, um, digitizing and describing all of these objects. So that literally meant, you know, scanning a piece of correspondence from the Millers to Aero Saarinen saying that they had bought the land that they wanted to build this house on, 
or Alexander Girard sending uh, textile samples back and forth to Mrs. Miller asking if she liked them. Um, but all of those were collected, arranged, described, and then I uploaded them to the internet. Um, here's one uh, example of the type of material that was included in the collection, but this is a layout of the main floor of the house and you see Alexander Girard has gone around and specified all of the different textiles that he wants either for drapery or upholstery. Um, you can see them pointing to individual chairs even um, and then the pit pillows which are at the bottom which I just uh, described but all to say this is the type of stuff that makes up a design archive. It's, it's multimedia um, and Obviously, we're all design geeks, I'm assuming, on this call. So uh, again, it was an interesting time of um, museums figuring out how to share this type of material on the interweb. Um, another example of the type of stuff that was in the Miller House collection. So the home was on the cover of House and Garden short, shortly after it was uh, finished and published anonymously. Um, but while I was working on the project, it was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and part of the stipulation of the grant was that we would share the progress of the project. Um, and this was a time when Tumblr had just come on and I don't doubt anybody uses Tumblr on here now. Um, but it was a place to sort of quickly share uh, what we were seeing as we were seeing it, describing what it was. This, for example, was a needlepoint pattern that was uh, done by Alexander Girard that was handed off to Xenia Miller, Mrs. Miller, and then her and her friends uh, did a needlepoint circle and did all of these individual um, seating cushions for their sarin and tulip chairs. So this was a really fun project that we could update and share and it kind of gained some traction um, and was shared on um, design publications and kind of is, are, is what led me to working at Herman Miller. My former boss followed this project and um, Herman Miller opened up an archives position and I got the job after I was done um, with my two year grant funded project. Um, so my first uh, job was corporate archivist and now I am the head of archives and brand heritage and we'll sort of talk about what that means today. Um, so since you guys can't actually be in my office, I'm gonna give you a little spin around and talk about the different types of material that we have. Um, it's, the archive is literally um, a giant warehouse with boxes and furniture. Um, the type of stuff that's stored in here ranges from kind of your run of the mill business records, correspondence, receipts and such, but also can, there's also a lot of evidence here from the design process. Um, here's a letter from George Nelson, um, Herman Miller's uh, director of design in the mid 40s to the founder of the company, DJ Dupree. So a little kind of inside baseball background. George Nelson was brought on in the mid 40s um, and was designing a lot of case goods, uh, desks and such. He was also um, an editor and a writer before he became to Herman, before he came to Herman Miller as the design director and knew about the work of Charles and Ray Eames. And almost as soon as he got hired by Herman Miller also suggested to the company that they acquire um, the Eames molded plywood furniture line, or at least acquire the ability to distribute. And so this is a quick letter from George Nelson telling DJ Dupree that all of the competition uh, has washed out and they're picking between Herman Miller or setting up their own plant. Um, so this element of uh, design history and the process of the decision making um, obviously probably at the time didn't seem that remarkable but now as an archivist I'm really glad that this stuff uh, exists um, it's great for storytelling and then with that becomes uh, documents like this so this was a copy of the patent that was filed for the Eames molded plywood furniture so not only is something like this useful now truly to our legal department, but from a content perspective, which we inform on, um, this is the sort of stuff that could be cool to share on Instagram or put on Pinterest. So the, the material has a life outside of the boxes that you saw them where they're kept in. Um, 
One of my favorite collections that we have is from a guy named Pep Nagelkirk, uh, who is the head of Herman Miller's model shop. And he was sort of the intermediary between people like George Nelson and the Eames office who was working with their individual offices. And George Nelson was based in New York. The Eameses were in LA. Um, and it was Pep's job sort of back at Herman Miller, uh, the mothership to figure out how they would produce some of these designs. And so these individual product folders um, not only are just great reading, but um, they're helpful in the product development process now and you'll kind of see why. But obviously, um, I guess also telling you what this is. So you guys might be familiar with George Nelson's coconut chair. Um, and around 1956, 57, um, he started to look at changing or creating an additional profile of the coconut chair that was more of a lounge, um, probably after the Eameses had uh, released their famous um, Eames Lounge and Ottoman. So this is Nelson sort of riffing, like, hmm, maybe we could make this chair into a lounge shape. It didn't work. Um, and here are some reasons why. Uh, the chair is ugly and the chair is uncomfortable. So obviously this is really funny. I love this for a multitude of reasons, one being um, you just don't get this type of correspondence saved anymore because how much of these conversations happens in an email, a Slack message, a text message. So I kind of love how formally communication had to happen um, and there's still some humor injected into it. But also this is evidence for today where if I had a creative director or product manager come to me and say, did you ever try um, a, a lounge a uh, profile of the coconut chair, I can kind of point back to this and say, yes, and it didn't work, and here's why. Uh, we also have a huge photography collection, so think about all of the types of photo assets that are made, at least by a furniture company, whether they be white sweeps or event photography or images of our stuff in a showroom. Um, we also have a large body of work by Charles and Ray Eames, um, so not only were they designing and figuring out how to make their furniture, but they are also sort of on staff photographers for a while. And this is an image of Alexander Girard and his wife, Susan, um, in Herman Miller's San Francisco showroom during its opening in 1957. So Girard designed the interiors, which you see um, are very loud and colorful, but the Eameses and the Girards were friends. So I also like thinking about them just sort of snapping this right before the party starts. Um, I also love the Eames photography collection because it shows you their experimentations, um, more specifically Ray's from an art direction standpoint. So these chairs, the way that they're arranged, they're super dynamic. You see Ray's flower arranging that she liked to do. Um, but this is from you know the early 50s and it's not just pictures of chairs in a room. There's an artfulness to it, um, which I think Ray really brought to the office in terms of um, her sort of having her hand in everything, whether it was figuring out the pitch of the arm on the Eames Lounge and Ottoman or art directing photo shoots. This is another favorite image from the Eames of mine. Um, this was done early, probably the late 40s for the introduction of the molded plywood group for Herman Miller. And again, you look at this and you don't necessarily understand at the outset that you're looking at a room full of furniture. Um, it looks like kind of an assemblage piece. And again, I, I love the playfulness and the experimentation that the Eames has brought to product photography. Um, for Herman Miller's 1948 catalog, which was uh, put together by George Nelson and was sort of the introduction of Nelson, Eames, and Asamo Noguchi, um, Nelson hired a photographer named Ezra Stoller to do the product photography. So Ezra Stoller was kind of the most famous architectural photographer at the time. So it was, it was smart of Nelson to hire an architectural photographer for his take on what furniture should look like in a catalog. So you look at this image of the Noguchi table, which maybe you've seen before, but it's monumental. Um, it's photographed like you would photograph a building um, and has now become one of the more iconic images of this particular table. Um, we also have sets of photos from old Herman Miller employees, which I love. Um, these were shot by um, a guy named Jim Eppinger, who was Herman Miller's first 
East Coast sales representative. And here I can imagine that he went out to Santa Fe to visit Alexander Girard, the head of our textile division where he lived. Um, so you got Girard there with his dog and some of his folk art collection that he lived with. And then you get moments like this where it's Charles and Ray Eames hanging out in their house in Pacific Palisades. Um, and again, you just imagine what it was like for Jim Evinger, at least I do as a design history geek, um, going and getting to visit all these people and kind of documenting what he was seeing, who he was meeting. And now that little uh, collection of snapshots lives in the archives. Um, we also have a huge collection of advertisements. So Herman Miller was placing ads in publications like interiors and arts and architecture, usually a designer named Irving Harper was designing those um, advertisements for the George Nelson office. Some more of Irving's work. Um, he, I got to spend some time with him before he passed away and he made a remark that he loved designing advertisements for Herman Miller because he could make the furniture as small as he wanted on the page. So as you can see, um, these are pretty avant-garde in terms of what they're trying to sell to you, um, very type-driven. Um, and that was sort of Nelson's, uh, Nelson's reasoning behind that was they didn't have that money, that much money to advertise. And so usually they're only placing one ad every couple of months and they wanted people to be flipping through the magazines and stop. What am I looking at? So I think that worked. Something like this also probably elicited that response and also kind of, if you know anything about Irving, um, Irving was a, a visited the Museum of Modern Art often in New York City and found inspiration from all sorts of things. So I imagine this advertisement um, that is actually for the poles that were available on Nelson Case Goods. So what you're seeing are furniture poles and then um, options for wood species that he's interpreted in sort of an African mask sort of way. Um, but again, something as boring as wood species and poles uh, gets turned into something like this. I also love this advertisement for textiles where Irving's experimenting with ripped paper. Um, and these sort of very meta, what I call ads for ads. So the ad on the left is for a textile binder that if you were an interior designer going through interiors, that was Herman Miller encouraging you to buy the samples that, so that you could specify our product. Or on the right, the Eameses were designing little in-store kios um, little kiosks for their product. And again, you were encouraged as a retailer to pick one of those up and hang it from your ceiling. Uh, one of, another one of my favorite collections is our clippings file. So um, I'll also give a plug to all of the invisible work uh, that went into making Herman Miller's giant archive, which was usually done by administrative assistants or people that were managing correspondence for others, so usually women. Um, so I just imagine an admin like flipping through the October 8th, 1949 uh, New Yorker issue that had this advertisement for um, the Noguchi coffee table and unfortunately gluing it, but saved it nonetheless. But now we have that in our collection. Um, we also have a vault. So this is sort of like the grand reveal when you come to visit. Um, but this is a more temperature and humidity controlled space. Um, so super HVAC, all that stuff. And in here we keep some more rare, some rare pieces of furniture, things like photography negatives and films. Um, and some earlier pieces of our advertising ephemera, um, but kind of the, the most important stuff is in here. Another view, um, I have flat files. I love my spinning storage that I have so I can get as much in there as possible. Another view of boxes that make me look like I'm really organized. And then we have a huge textile collection as well. So I mentioned Alexander Girard a few times, but again, he was the head of Herman Miller's textile division from the early 50s to the early 70s. And he designed over 300 textiles in a multitude of colorways. So this one for feathers that you see is constantly riffing on color stories. And I don't know when he slept um, because he just produced so much work. Um, Herman Miller, Maharam, the textile company, is now part of the Herman Miller family, and today they are um, the producers of Alexander Girard textile and wall covering designs. 
um, but I work with their uh, product development department pretty closely to do product development research and also um, supply samples such as these um, to make sure we're bringing them back correctly. Also have stuff like the famous splints that were designed by Charles and Ray Eames um, and were sort of the final experiment before they really, this is where they perfected the 3D plywood molding process. And then another thing you see below is a hand carved prototype um, from an element of the Eames tandem seating, so the airport seating, but this was a piece that you see is now cast in aluminum. So this was them sort of riffing on it before they cast it in aluminum. We also have drawings in our collection. So Charles and Ray Eames weren't necessarily doing tons of sketching of all their products. They were really hands-on, but um, drawings like this were usually generated out of Herman Miller's Technical Center, uh, which was founded by the Eameses um, or encouraged by the Eameses to start. And now we have a, a test lab as we call it now, but it's sort of where the products were um, tested to make sure that they were structurally sound and always kind of looking for a way to make things better. Um, so I've probably said the Eames's names a million times, George Nelson, Alexander Girard. There are actually a lot of people who were part of Herman Miller's design legacy and a really fun part of my job is kind of seeking those people out and telling those stories that maybe haven't been told. Um, how they should be. And so the woman on the left is named Tomoko Miho, and she was a Japanese American designer who worked for George Nelson's office and was actually the head of his graphic design division for a time. Um, on the right is Herman Miller's, what I deem a famous 1964 catalog. So sort of the first time that a furniture catalog had appeared um, in this sort of binder format. Um, but Tomoko was responsible for the design and art direction of this piece. Um, I love her art direction for this school seating photography. So it's very sculptural. I mean, I think Herman Miller has shared this image on Instagram since, and it always gets a lot of likes, but I love that she's taken something that could be perceived as boring, like seating for a school um, and turning it into sculpture. Um, here's some other catalogs that she did. Um, but I would say among like Herman Miller super fans, these pieces of graphic design are more well known, but usually attributed just solely to George Nelson. But um, Tomoko had her own illustrious graphic design career. And I think it's really cool that she was part of Herman Miller's legacy. So I like seeking out those stories um, and telling them as well. Uh, so a little bit about how the archive is used um, kind of on a day to day basis. We're really close to the product development process. Um, a couple of years ago, Design Within Reach came to Herman Miller and said that they needed another addition to their bed offering. And if there was something that Herman Miller um, could maybe bring back from the archives. So with that, we dug into the archives and pulled out um, George Nelson's Thin Edge Bed Series and Daybed. So literally getting the drawings out of our collection, the details, and you'll see here on the left is an original sketch of the thin edge bed. And then on the right is some of our newer product photography after we reintroduce this bed collection. And again, you'll see it here. So the day bed. I love all of the, um, all of the notes on the drawings. And then, um, you know, when we're going to market with this sort of stuff, so now it's done, it's in the store. Now our PR is trying to get press for it. Then they come back to me and ask, do we have any images from the archives that we could pitch um, either you know, to press, put on the product page, et cetera. Um, so I'm really lucky that I sometimes get to see things from a very nose to tail process, um, but just also giving me a sense of how, how these assets are used. Um, a big project that I worked on um, in my time at Herman Miller, I've been here about five years, is this monograph, uh, history of the company, um, that was a great excuse to kind of just dig into our own collection at Herman Miller and also understand um, where Herman Miller adjacent material lived around the world and other design museum collections. So the way the book is set up, it's sort of our history told through moments in time where things changed pretty fundamentally in Herman Miller. So this is from our first chapter. Gilbert Rohde was actually Herman Miller's first 
modern designer. Um, he came on in the early 30s and switched Herman Miller from an antique reproduction furniture company, which is what we started off as. So stuff that was faked to look old and sort of um, or encouraged our founder, DJ Dupree, to start making modern furniture. Um, so in the book, we also reprinted some of the primary source material that we had access to. So the, the essay on the left is actually um, by Gilbert Rohde about a school that he founded or called the Design Laboratory. Um, so I kind of felt like, or we felt like we had these opportunities to read these um, texts from design history that you might not get to see otherwise unless you have your nose in a book at a library. So we used our book um, to sort of reprint things that we thought might be of interest today. Um, but also we kind of have these moments in time or tell these stories about different elements of Herman Miller's graphic history. So this is shortly after we introduced the M. So our logo mark is an M. Um, and kind of showing you how that was interpreted into environmental graphics. But for example, on this page, um, some of this, some images came from our archives, some from the Library of Congress, some from the Beecher Design Museum, some from the University of Mich Michigan Library. So really it was um, a huge effort to sort of cull all of this material and put it together and make sense of it. Um, and again, Another part of our graphic history, um, I'm really lucky in my job that I get to look at this stuff every day, but it was an amazing opportunity to put this stuff sort of in context and show you how the work relates to one another, similar graphic language. Um, again, you get another essay from Alexander Girard. So rather than me telling you the history or what Girard thought about good design, um, you can actually read from him himself. Um, and then the book, it's not just a look back, but it's also a look at how Herman Miller's history informs um, its present and also its future. So this is a spread in the book talking about our um, more recently opened retail store in New York City at 251 Park Avenue South. Um, and when our designers were approaching this project, there was a lot of inspiration taken from Alexander Girard and how he um, did interiors and showrooms and same with the Eameses and all of that, but you kind of see this visual language that extends even to today. Um, a little bit about the research process for this. Um, I got to spend effectively two weeks in a reading room at the Library of Congress going through the Eames collection, which was for me personally at least a dream come true. Um, you actually do have to get a library card when you go to the Library of Congress. So I was a lot more excited than I look in this picture, but the little glimpse into what a reading room is like there. Um, and then this is how the Eames's more than 1 million individual objects uh, got put in boxes and stored at the Library of Congress. So the collection split between the manuscripts division and the photography. So on the left, you have um, a box for the manuscripts and I'll show you guys, you know, what sort of material is in there. And then on the right, um, we went through, the Eameses donated close to, I want to say 100,000 color slides. Um, and we also wanted to get a lot of color into the book and kind of the only way that you can get color imagery from the late 40s um, is to go through tiny little Kodachrome slides. Um, so spent a lot of time looking through a loop into tiny slides. Uh, but for the manuscripts division, you kind of see material like this where somebody in the Eames office uh, sketched up assembly instructions for um, the shell chairs and this presumably or a copy of it was sent off to Herman Miller to include in our sales material. And then you get stuff like this. This is Ray Eames um, kind of doing a mock-up for an invitation to an event in Herman Miller's Los Angeles showroom. But her handwriting and typography is just really fun and she also had a sense of color, but again, it kind of shows you really the, the breadth and depth of, of what she informed at Herman Miller um, and also just her creativity. Uh, the Eameses also had their own clippings collection. I love this. Um, Saul Steinberg was an illustrator for the New Yorker and famous artist on his own and friend of the Eameses and shortly after they 
finished the work on the molded fiberglass group, they invited him over and he did some fun little illustrations on chairs that uh, in the early 50s were taken as lewd. Um, so I just love that the Eameses saved this press about themselves and probably got a laugh out of it as well. Um, and this came from a more uh, a surreal moment going through the manuscripts division where I opened up a folder and it was just scraps of paper and I'm like, what? But then you look at all these together. Um, also remembered Ray Eames collected a lot of decorative papers. And so all of these were nice textures, some matte, some not. And what I kind of realized was that this was probably a color study that Ray was doing um, and just got packed up on a desk and sent off to the Library of Congress, which is at once a little absurd, but also amazing. I'm glad it got kept. Um, and to also give you a sense of uh, what these little slides were like. This is Ray Eames um, sitting outside of their house in Pacific Palisades. Just a nice little moment. Um, so another aspect of my job, uh, or at least in this context, was we finished the book and then last year when we launched it, we had an exhibit in our store in New York City um, to celebrate. So you see the visual language from the book put onto a giant wall, which is cool. Um, I talked earlier about Herman Miller um, switching from an antique reproduction furniture company to a modern, and this is a very visual representation of that. So on the left is this princess dresser, um, and a, less than a year later, we were making um, the vanity that you see on the right that was designed by Gilbert Rohde. So clean lines definitely have to be way more of uh, an experienced woodworker to do that. But this is sort of the visual representation of the huge shift um, in the business that happened at Herman Miller. Um, and then just a view of the exhibit itself. So all of the material that you see is actually from our collection. Um, some of the stuff I acquired in the process of making the book, but each chapter gets its own little spotlight. And then a chance for us to showcase things like early uh, Eames LCW or some of George Nelson's case goods. Um, but again, just to give you guys a sense of what type of work and projects that the archives are brought into from obviously a more commercial standpoint and how the archival material gets used for storytelling and brand building. Um, this is a chapter about Alexander Girard where you see some of the textile samples and wallpapers, um, some of the early catalogs, um, and then a chance to get our first ergonomic seating solution, the ergon chair in here. But again, um, this was a great moment to sort of take what was on the page of the book and show it to you in real life. Um, maybe some of you got to see it in New York, but again, um, the stuff in the archives doesn't just sit there. Um, it's something that's used often and we not only are lending um, to ourselves when we do exhibits like this, but I also have a lot of ongoing relationships with museums and curators. Um, so our stuff gets cited and used a lot, which is fun for me. Um, one of my favorite things we have is this little model kit for Action Office 2, which was our first uh, big office product, um, but you can kind of see uh, the way that people were encouraged to sell this was to purchase this kit that had little pieces that you could kind of set up a panel-based office system and kind of show your uh, client how it might work, but I liked setting them up to make it look like they were talking. Um, and then if you ever come to West Michigan, there are big giant red Herman Miller trucks that are on the highway all of the time, and for a little while there was a die cast um, a die cast toy company that would do these little trucks uh, that we have a lot in our collection they're like kind of a uh, a deep cut that sometimes you can find them on eBay but um, this was a fun chance to put those in love showing the trucks and that's it um, I think yeah I think I have just enough time for questions um, but that was just a little bit about what I do how we use the archives at Herman Miller. Um, and now I'm happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you, Amy. That was such a fascinating look into the archives. We really appreciate you sharing. 
Students, we're going to turn it over to Q&A now. So you can submit your questions either at the bottom or top of your screen. You'll find that Q&A function. Amy, can you tell us a little bit more about what your day-to-day -day looks like at Herman Miller? Ooh, every day is different, and I'm like not even exaggerating. Um, in the before COVID times, um, Herman Miller does a lot of B2B selling, so we have clients come out to um, the headquarters a lot, and so some days I'm like giving tours of the archives, or I'm doing product development research, or I'm helping gather content for Instagram, or I'm doing something like this. Um, so it's, it's really different every single day and we are an often used resource across the business. I don't know if I said that, but I mean, I'm positioned within our marketing department, but in reality, I work a lot with our product teams, legal, um, HR from onboarding, cause we're the heritage, we're the history. And so when you start at Herman Miller, most people know who they're coming to work for, but I think it's also, um, to attract and retain talent. Um, it's a differentiator and honestly, I think industry-wide too, um, we have a history that is deep and uh, also is sort of the genesis of American modernism and uh, that gets used a lot both internally and externally. Right, and for those who might not know what it means, B2B stands for business to business. That's something I had to learn. There's so many acronyms in the furniture industry, and I'm still learning them, so please. I'm right there with you. <laughs> uh, so these archives really provide a wealth of design history that's available to the team. How do you work with the team for them to draw inspiration from the brand history, but still stay new? That's a good question. I mean, I, I also have to do a lot of um, explaining internally as well. I think sometimes people hear archives and like, well, we don't want it to feel old or vintage or retro. But in reality, I think the way that our collection is best used is when it's for inspiration to do something different or to have fun with it. I think if you looked at all of those ads, um, George Nelson and his crew of graphic designers really had carte blanche when it came to what they wanted the Herman Miller brand to look and feel like. I think obviously now it's more buttoned up, but I like to show that work as kind of a reminder that you can get weird. Um, and also, I think, especially from a product standpoint, I mean, you guys saw in the, the coconut chair example, but there's sometimes a reason why things didn't work or why they did work, and there's sometimes that exact evidence that tells you. So I think research is really important in any design process. Kind of have to know where you're where you've been to know where you're going. So I think it's not so much to like, let's make something that looks like the Eameses, but more, um, hey, we have a we have a heritage or a history of um commissioning the best and um, coolest graphic designers to do illustrations or art direction for us. So that should continue um, as we move forward. That's great. Could you give us some examples of current assets that get filed into the archives? Do emails make it into the archives? We are working on that. I'm actually in the midst of a giant uh, records management and records retention policy uh, revamp right now, which is like the not sexy part of my job. But it is because you guys saw that letter at the beginning where it's like George Nelson writing to DJ Dupree that we're going to acquire the Eames furniture line. And that bit of correspondence actually in the collection has like a box, like in the folder, there's a laid in memo from DJ that says, I saved all this for sentimental reasons. Don't know if it has any business value. Feel free to destroy if you want. And thankfully, nobody destroyed that because it was all the initial correspondence with Nelson and the contracts. Um, but today I'm trying to figure out how to do that with email. And it's as simple as like, how do you um, save the correspondence between our business leaders and the business leaders at DWR, hey, to sort of get that story 50 years from now about how that merger and acquisition happened. So it's a lot of me being a squeaky wheel around the business. 
Um, and also it's helpful to be baked into the product development process because if we have process documents or things from the designers themselves, thankfully I'm able to correspond with them. But um, yeah, digital stuff is hard. I mean, I literally have like animated GIFs that we've commissioned for our Instagram saved on a hard drive. And so we're looking at digital objects. And also this week, um, we signed a contract with the Internet Archive and archive it, which means we have the Internet Archive crawling our web pages and our social media to sort of save things. So and then some days I get literally like a old piece of furniture that a retiree wants to donate or an old catalog. So we have a really from an, from archives land perspective, like we have a really robust retiree network. And so we have people that are wanting to donate things um, or offer stuff up to become part of the collection. So we're acquiring digital, physical, uh, old and new all of the time. That's great. Speaking of digital, do you think there will be a role within companies for an archivist um, for companies that were started in this internet era? I mean, I think so. I think that if you are a company that I think like brand storytelling, it's like always been a thing, but I think right now, especially when you, if you're a startup, like what you want to appear, uh, you want to appear authentic. You want to appear that you have a story. You want to, you know, storytelling is so important to every brand. And I feel like in my job, I'm kind of the, the, or one of the nexus points of that. And there maybe wasn't an archivist at Herman Miller when it started 115 years ago, but they started collecting, they like administrative assistants started filing things pretty early on that now necessitated um, the use for an archivist. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think they're useful at all companies, especially if you want to document your history, but I think they can also be posed as like content creators as well. And I think, at Herman Miller, that's sort of how I've evolved my job. Because I think sometimes, again, people hear archivist and they think I'm 90 years old and I sit in a dusty room all day. But in reality, we generate a lot of con content for the business. Um, and yeah, I say I, we're like the Herman Miller mediums. We connect the past, present, and future. Um, and I think that's really important. It's a great way of looking at it. How often do you remove materials and how do you determine what materials to remove and then where do those go? That's an awesome question. Um, weeding, as we call it, is in a very important part of the archival process. And I think we're a little bit behind on ours, but um, I mean, I think it's really easy to destroy or get rid of something like a bunch of expense reports from a project that doesn't really have enduring value. Um, but then there's also interesting opportunities um, that we're exploring where it's like, we have 100 copies of a publication that we put out in the 80s that either I can identify um, design institutions to donate them to, or like, it's my dream to do like a printed matter art book fair table of like Herman Miller ephemera that you know, I don't need a hundred copies of a brochure, but some graphic design nerds might like to have one for their own reference library. So it's, it's ongoing, I guess. That's not like a super specific answer, but we do, we do get rid of stuff sometimes. How many people work in the archive department? Or are there different members of the team that specialize in different categories? Um, Hopefully one day we will be a team of many. Right now it is me and um, one other person. Her name is Alexa Hagen. She is the archivist. So it's kind of funny that my title is head of when it's just me and another person for now. Um, we will expand the team eventually. And um, yeah, I mean, I came from an art museum and a library where you have people that specialize in different types of materials. So if I'm frank, I am not a film archivist, I am not a photo archivist. So my expertise isn't always necessarily um, in the material that I'm dealing with. So I'm hoping as uh, the archive function expands that we will have more people, but for now we are a small team of two. 
In your opinion, the manufacturing process, how has it changed today from, say, the Eames time? I mean, I'm not a des I'm not an industrial designer, so my pers so I don't I don't know that I have the best answer for that other than what I observe is that the process I don't know if it's faster, but there's a lot more iteration happening and so with like the Eameses working on one chair, you might not get you know, you get some back and forth, but I think now I think about all the tweaks and design changes that can happen very quickly in the digital realm. Um, and so when I talk to designers now, um, and friends who are industrial designers, I kind of encourage them to take notice of what are the aha moments in the design process where maybe something has fundamentally changed because I don't think you can or should save every CAD drawing necessarily, but there are definitely gonna be moments along the way in the design process um, that you save. I will also say that learning in my job is that people like the Eameses were obsessive about documenting themselves and their process and same with George Nelson. So I would encourage um, every, all the students listening, like it might, feel cringy, but like a personal brand and documenting yourself is important. Um, and whether that's like on a website or a blog or whatever, but I would not have a job had it not been for the obsessive documentation that the Eameses or George Nelson or Alexander Girard, who is like a better archivist than I will ever be. But that's like the common thread among all of these people. They were documenting their own process and sort of picked out what they thought was important or how they wanted the story to be told, which I think it's hand in hand. Um, so save your work or like have a folder on your desktop that you dump everything in. That's great advice. How did you become an archivist? So I studied art history for some reason, like I ended up being best friends with all like graphic designers. So my design fandom sort of started as an observer. Um, and then I got a job at a rare book library and was like, rare book library? I didn't even know that there was something like this. And then also kind of quickly realized that like, I didn't want to be an antiquarian. Like it wasn't the Gutenberg Bible that was really exciting me, even though like from a construction standpoint it was and how old it was, but I really liked artist books and sort of the more um, designy rare books uh, that were more recent. Um, and then I got an internship at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And around the time that I started my internship, um, the IMA acquired the Miller House, which I talked about before. And then I just sort of finagled um, a job as the archives assistant there, digitizing that collection. And that was sort of my, I just kind of blindly followed um, my interests. Not that I wasn't intentional about it, but design was sort of something that piqued my interest. I didn't go to design school. Um, I'm kind of just a giant fan. Um, and right place, right time. I did had to do an internship that led me to my job and I was super lucky. That's great. I know you've touched on this a little bit already, but would you mind walking us through how you archive current or new projects? Yeah, I mean, I would say that we're still sort of coming up with the perfect checklist of how documentation happens now. Um, as I was saying, I think the best collections that we have in our archive were sort of generated by the creators themselves. So um, in archives world, like original order is the best way that you can keep something, meaning whoever the records creator was and whatever they did. Now, sometimes it, that might be like, oh, I cleaned out my desk and put it all in there. But most of the time, if people have the mind to send you something, they're going to arrange it in a way that makes sense to them. Um, but today, I would say, like, like I said, we've started crawling our websites with archive it. So sort of managing that also just being close to the product development processes and getting material from the designers themselves. Um, and then just staying, staying close to our product management teams for 
you know, I mean, so much is digital now. So when I need all of the promotional photography for the new Michael Anastasiades bed, like I go into our marketing document asset management system and just keep my own, um, keep my own copies of things. So uh, it's case by case and kind of, again, just being a squeaky wheel and being involved, but all to say that we're also kind of honing in on um, checklists and workflows that make sure that we're not missing anything. In the archives, are there any gaps in the history of Herman Miller? And if so, how do you fill them in? Yes, there are. I would say that there's probably going to be a gap for like the last 10 years as communication has gone digital. Um, I'm like such a dork and I like printing things out still because paper is the easiest way. So, I mean, it's even like, what did Herman Miller's first web page look like? And you can go into the internet archive and go to the Wayback Machine and like, how do you save that? And it, we ran into it with, um, the Herman Miller book as we were putting it together. It's like, we need a screenshot on Netscape of the first website. Thankfully, we found that. But I mean, digital makes it hard. And then you also have like, there's one story, um, a woman named Frida Diamond was hired as a furniture designer for Herman Miller at the same time Gilbert Rohde was hired. And she designed a line of furniture. It was, so Rhodey was doing like ultra modern and Frida Diamond, who was sort of like a proto Martha Stewart. She was like lifestyle brand, did glassware, industrial design. Um, she was hired by Herman Miller to sort of design a line that felt a little bit more folksy, um, less harsh and ultra modern, I guess, than, than, than what Rhodey was doing. Um, but she also designed a line of shaker inspired furniture and she herself says that she is the first designer that introduced shaker style furniture to um, a general buying public and we have some correspondence from her we have you know and it's stuff from when she was later in life like kind of writing to Herman Miller asking if we had images or documentation but like I don't have the letter from DJ to her asking her to come on or even like it's really easy to miss her, even though she designed two giant lines of furniture for Herman Miller, um, there wasn't a ton, a ton of documentation about her in the collection. So that's just kind of me then finding my own little rabbit holes that I go down and try to kind of cull stuff that maybe has been misidentified in our own collection or just not identified at all. Um, and I think that's the case for a lot of archives. I mean, archives are not neutral and I also think that it's an important part of my job to um, make the collection more inclusive when it comes to whose stories are told. Right. The process of archiving is incredibly human. How has technology changed the way you manage or tell stories with these assets? Yeah, I mean, like my favorite example I like to use, like I just think about how much of my work happens over text message or Slack and you don't get this like concise, well-written, funny, acerbic like memo from somebody in an office anymore. It's more like an eye roll emoji. And like that, I don't know how you get that back. I mean, I don't, who knows like if we're ever going to be able to go back and look at all of our Instagrams from yesteryear, but um, it's hard. I mean, and it's, I think archives too are like word of mouth a little bit. So I feel like I have to be carry the torch um, in a lot of ways and also spend time with people that have worked at the company to hear their stories and like, you know, oral histories are really great ways to get uh, people talking about things. Um, but yeah, digital commu communication makes it harder and a little less human, but then you just kind of have to find ways to make it more human. Right. What for you has been the most exciting thing you've rediscovered in the archives? Honestly, I, I'm like such a Tomoko Miho fan and her graphic design work even outside of Herman Miller is really amazing. She did some awesome posters um, and I love her work. And she's somebody who was not a self promoter and actually though 
worked for some of the greatest design firms or companies and um I dream I'm like I want to do a Tomoko Miho book or exhibition one day so I think that's probably my favorite that's great unfortunately we are just out of time for today but I do have one last question are there any final words of wisdom or advice that you'd like to leave the students who have tuned in today do your research that I love research I've learned so much obviously by reading um, but I think it's good to know all of your references um, because usually people are not solving an entirely new problem. Um, so know your design history. It's really important. That's great advice. Well, Amy, I want to say a huge thank you for this incredible look into the archives. We really appreciate you taking the time. Students, we want to say a huge thank you for tuning in today. If you'd like to learn more about Herman Miller, you can visit hermanmiller.com or visit their Instagram at Herman Miller. You can also follow Amy on Instagram at acid underscore free. If you'd like to learn more about the Original Americas, you can visit theoriginalamericas.com or our Instagram at theoriginalusa. Thank you. Thank you.